Hi, so in the previous video we looked at these assumptions for the new Keynesian model and in this video I'm going to just derive the model effectively and using a number of assumed functional forms and yeah we'll we'll solve the household and the firm maximization problem and then show the the key equations that this means and in a future video uh, we can continue to round this off with more evaluation and so on for the new Keynesian model. So given the assumptions that we made in the previous video we are going to have one side of the economy which is given by households who are going to have this representative household and they're going to maximize their utility and their utility function is given by this. We have it depends on consumption and labor and we have some elasticity of labor supply and they're going to be maximizing this in utility with respect to their budget constraint. And this budget constraint says that the nominal value of their consumption is going to be equal to the profits they get from their firm and the wages that they earn from working for a different firm. And we've, we've evaluated some of these with respect to the price level. And okay, we, we can solve this maximization problem. And that, that's what we'll do. So in order to do this, we can we could use the Lagrangian method, but instead th this is a simpler way to do it, where we can rearrange this budget constraint, which, which we had here, and uh, we can rearrange it so that we get consumption, or CI, on its own, and then just substitute that in, that consumption into our utility function up here. And then once we have everything just in terms of labor, we can just take a first order condition with respect to our one variable. So we substitute labor in to our utility function, as we've done here, and then we just take our first order condition with respect to labor. And so that's what I've done here. We've got our first order condition with respect to labor, and then I've just rearranged to find, put labor on one side, and fairly simple algebra, and we, we get this, this function for our optimal labor supply. This is the amount that an individual should be supplying of labor given the wage rate, given the price level, and given their elasticity of labor supply. It's worth noting that if this elasticity tends to 1, then we have an infinitely elastic labor supply, and we can, we can, well, our labor choice just depends on this elasticity of labor supply. We can make a number of assumptions, and we can empirically estimate this variable but yeah we we've derived our optimal labor supply here and we'll be coming back to that later and so now the other side of this economy is we're going to have the firms we made a number of assumptions about the firms but in this case we're going to have that our firms have some demand which is given by this equation here we know that the firms in the new keynesian model are monopolistically competitive there's a large number of them but each of them has a slightly differentiated good, so which are um, imperfect substitutes of each other, so they have some sort of market power, but they don't have monopoly power in this market. So this is our demand function, QI is equal to output multiplied by this relative price level. So we've got PI, which is the price of firm I's output, when com and this is compared or we look at the ratio of this to the just average price level of the entire economy. And then we have this to the power of negative eta. And this eta is the elasticity of substitution between different goods we talked about in our assumptions. And so this is going to tell us the sort of level of monopolistic competition we have, the level of competition in the market. And we're going to assume that this parameter is greater than 1. So yeah, we, we, we can get a bit of intuition from this by taking logarithms of both sides and we represent the natural log of each of these variables with the lowercase value of the letters and this gives us some intuition because we can look at this term or this second term on the right hand side and we basically see that if we have a lower n so if this, or not n, lower eta because this is a Greek letter so if we have a low n, we see that as this is a negative term, this is actually going to 
and show that consumers are less willing to give up the good eye following a rise in its price. So if we were to increase uh, the price of good eye, PI, but we keep the general price level the same, a low N is going to mean that this relative difference in the relative weighting to this value of PI minus P is going to be quite small because we're, we're multiplying it by quite a small factor. So the, the relative change in our quantity is going to be quite small and this shows that we have high market power of this good. So that's why we've taken logs just to show this in a more simple form that if we have a low N, this shows that consumers don't care too much about the relative price of this good. They, they really want this good because this good has high market power. It's very differentiated and it's got a higher elasticity of substitution. And the same can be said if we have a high level of N, we're, okay, now, yeah, if we have a high N, we're gonna have a high elasticity of substitution. So there's gonna be high substitutability of this good, so it's low market power. If we have a low N, we're going to have high market power because it's, it's not very, not a very substitutable good. Okay, so if we want to actually use this demand function, we, we tend to look at the inverse demand function um, because we look at our demand and based on the relative price level. So we're, we're thinking from the perspective of a firm. And so what we what we do is we take the inverse demand function, so we have the price level with respect to the quantity, and we are, if we're looking at the firm's decision, we want to think about their profit function, and their profits, or their nominal profits, as we have evaluated at the price level, are given by their output multiplied by the price level of their good, so PI multiplied by their quantity I, minus the wages that they're paying to their labor force. And we notice that this W isn't indexed, it's just W because we assume that we have a perfectly competitive labor market, so every firm is paying the same wage rate. And we're also gonna assume that we have this production function where output is just equal to the amount of labor that each firm employs. And so that simplifies things quite a lot. So given, given these equations that correspond to the firm's problem, we can now do a maximization problem for the firm. And of course, the firm is going to be maximizing its real profit. So it wants to maximize its profit level, which is given by pi i. And what I've done here is I've used this, this profit function and we've divided through by p so that we get just just this expression here and we can use the the other equations that we had just above so what we can do is we know that qi is equal to li as it says here so we can substitute that in for li there and we take that fraction or we we can then take qi out as it's common to both of these terms now so we get this and um, this expression here and then one more thing we can do is we can use the inverse demand function to substitute in for QI. Um, we can then substitute in here for this expression here. Why are we doing all this? It's just because it, it gives us the answer that we want. We, we could do all these things in a different way, but by, by rearranging and substituting in our expressions, we, we can get that we are maximizing profits we are max profits. And what's the choice variable of the firm? Well, they choose that their, their price, they choose PI. So we, we can then just take the first order condition with respect to PI over P, and then we can find what the optimal price is for all the firms. So that's what we'll do. We take the first order condition by taking the derivative with respect to, so we'll do D pi I with respect to d pi, I, pi over p. And we'll get out this expression. I won't, I won't do all the workings, but we can then rearrange this first order condition. We wanna get pi over p on its own on the left-hand side, and we get out this final term. Sorry that I've kind of skipped over a lot of the substitution and algebra, but it should be 
fairly straightforward once you have all these equations down on the page and you just start substituting them into each other to get to a simpler form. The more instructive thing is what we get out at the end of all of this and we get that our optimal price level is our real wage rate, so it's our wage divided by the price level multiplied by some markup and we, we see that this eta over eta minus one this is clearly greater than one because the the numerator is greater than the denominator because it's just eta is greater than eta minus one so we have some our price is some markup on our costs of the firm and this makes sense because we have monopolistic competition so we're going to have some sort of economic profit that these firms are making and we, we can consider the cases where we look at specific values of eta. So consider that eta tends to infinity. Well then, if we look at eta over eta minus one, well, we're just gonna, this is just gonna tend to infinity over infinity. And this is just going to be 10 to one. And so we have perfect competition. Our, our price then goes to just cover marginal cost. And that's what a perfect competition outcome would look like and the other side of things if we had eta tending to one we would then have that eta over eta minus one is going to tend to one over zero which tends to infinity it's undefined but it'll tend off to infinity and we have a pure monopoly where this markup is just going way off way off into infinity and so they can charge whatever price they want because they've got pure market power. So that's the firm's condition or the firm's optimal pricing rule. I've kind of lost it amongst all the madness, but we get this optimal price of a firm and it very much depends on the amount of market power they have, which is given by the parameter eta. So what we can do now is we can formulate an ag aggregate demand relationship and this is given by the quantity equation which we may have covered in earlier in our aggregate demand courses um, but we, we basically derive this relationship as our aggregate demand relation and um, because we have cash in a cash in advance constraint where consumers have to hold some level of money in order to make transactions and once we've got this aggregate demand function, we can start to think of aggregating our um, representative firm and representative households maximization problems to the whole economy. And we do this through the fact that we're going we're having a symmetric symmetric equilibrium. Uh, and this is basically because we have we had already assumed that we have identical households and we had identical um, firms. So what we can now do from those assumptions is we know that identical households and identical firms, they're gonna supply and demand the exact same amount of labor as each other. So L or the labor supply from household I is going to be equal to the labor supply from every household. So we can write that the labor supply from household I is just equal to the aggregate labor supply L. And what can we do with this? Well, what we said before we had our production function, which was that the quantity produced by firm I was equal just to the labor supply of firm I or the labor used. So we now know that our labor is equal to QI which is, so our aggregate labor rate is equal to this QI. And we also know that aggregate output is just going to be equal to this L because of the production function that we used and we're aggregating this up to the whole economy. So our, we have the, the, these things are all equal. Our aggregate labor supply is equal to our individual firm's quantity. And this is equal to the aggregate output just from the fact that we have a symmetric equilibrium. So what, how can we take this even further? Yeah, by, we, we can do that by using the relationship we derived just a minute ago, 
which was this one right here from the firm's problem we got this relationship of markup pricing and I've just written that down again here and so we've got that the relative price level of one firm's output to the overall price level is equal to this markup of the real wage real wage rate real wage rate and so what we can do with this is we can use the household optimi optimal um, choice which we derived way up here I said we'd come back to it we had that the labor for a firm I is equal to the real wage rate to the power of 1 over uh, gamma minus 1 and what we can do with that so we we had what we had this that this is equal to uh, if I if I can remember this was equal to W over P 1 over gamma minus 1 and what we've now said is that this is equal to the aggregate level of labor um, so we can we can rearrange this by um, move, moving the power from one side to the other and then have that L to the gamma minus 1 is equal to W over P and then we can just substitute this in for W over P and that's what we've done here to get that eta over eta minus 1 um, multiplied by the aggregate labor supply to the power of gamma minus 1 and this is all equal still to this pi over p and we've got this relationship up here that our if we get rid of this uh, qi in the middle we have that l is equal to y so we can just substitute that in here and we now have this relationship between the price level and the output in our economy so if we still assume that we're in a symmetric equilibrium this will also mean that every firm charges the same price so we have that pi is equal to just p the overall price level and so if we have this we're going to have that pi over p is just equal to one and um, we have just derived above that pi over p is equal to this expression here so this expression is equal to one so by multiplying across our eta minus 1 and dividing through by our eta and then shifting this power over to the side we then get this result that we have our output is equal to eta minus 1 over eta all to the power of 1 over gamma minus 1 and what we will notice about this is that this is less than 1 it's less than 1 because our numerator in this fraction is eta minus one and our denominator is eta so this fraction is going to be less than one and all all we've done is just raise this to a power so it's going to remain to be less than one and then from, from this expression we can also derive our price level we we have the quantity equation that y equals m over p or y equals m over p so then p equals m over y as I've got here and then we can just substitute this y in uh, for that y on the bottom of the equation. So the price level isn't necessarily the most interesting thing here but what, what we'd like to focus on is this the fact that our output is less than 1 because if we were at a socially optimum output we would have that our output is equal to 1 we ideally want y star equal to one and this is what would happen if we were in a perfectly competitive market and so the, this is what we would have as we said before if n tends to infinity and so this eta minus one over eta just tends to one and that's what our output is that's one uh, however and obviously that that's our optimal level because that's what we would have under perfect competition which is and flexible prices which we which we know gives us our Pareto optimal outcomes so what we notice is that our output under monopolistic competition is actually less than our output that we get under perfect competition so monopolistic competition gives us a suboptimal outcome 
Now this shouldn't be new. The fact that we have market power and firms can set their price above marginal cost, we're gonna have some dead weight losses in this economy. And here we can just illustrate that through the fact that we are having underproduction. And this is something that we learn early on in an economics course that if we have monopoly, they're going to deliberately underproduce the good so that they can increase their price because they'll set their marginal cost equal to marginal revenue. And the, the same is true for monopolistic competition. They don't have as much market power as a monopoly, but they still can restrict production and increase the price. So a couple of things to notice if we have our output below our suboptimal level is that we have some asymmetric welfare effects of a, a shock. So for example, imagine we have um, a positive aggregate um, demand shock that, that we looked at in a previous video. And so we, we're gonna say increase our output through an aggregate demand shock. Well, if we're increasing our Y, well, that means that we're going to move closer to our Y star because we're we're currently below Y star, so we're going to move a bit closer. So, so this is good. We get close to the social optimum. However, if we have a negative aggregate demand shock and we decrease Y, well, we're going to move very far away from our Y star. I don't think I've illustrated that very well <laughs> there, but that, that's meant to just show that we're, we're already below our optimal level. And if we have a negative shock, we're gonna move even further away from it. So our positive shocks help us out a little bit because we are going to move a bit closer to the optimum, but our negative shock is gonna take us very far away. So our negative shocks are now very, very bad. And we, we can say that we have some sort of loss aversion where being further from, further from the optimal point is much worse than just getting a bit closer. So there are asymmetric welfare effects because bad shocks take us further away uh, than, than positive shocks. Positive shocks actually take us closer to the optimum. So that will just about wrap up this video just to avoid having far too long videos. So in the next one we're go going to look at adding menu costs to the mix and so we'll have non-neutral, non-neutrality of money and then we can properly consider our evaluation of the new Keynesian model. So do drop a like if this video was useful, do check out the playlist for those future videos and subscribe for lots of future videos.